And good day. Welcome to another edition of the Verbal Submission Podcast. This is your host, E. Marcel Portu. We're recording this on January 10th, 2020. This is our first edition of the new year. Hope everyone had a good holiday season, whether you celebrate Christmas, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, Three Kings, everything in between. Or if you don't celebrate any holidays, hopefully you got some time off of work. It was able to relax during the that period of time. We have a full show for you today. We're going to recap everything that took place in New Japan's Pro Wrestling's Wrestle Kingdom 14 and break down everything that took place there, including New Year's Dash and maybe some WWE wrestling news as well. But as always, if you want to follow everything that we're doing, head to the mothership at sportsinquirer.net, premier site for news and notes in the world of sports. If you head to our site, you'll be able to see not only some archives of our combat sport coverage, but also the Sports Inquirer show where we cover all things sports. We also do a podcast on basketball and baseball and everything in between. So make sure you head to the site and check everything out. You can head to Sports Inquirer, go to Twitter and Instagram and look up Sports Inquirer. That's one word. And you can find us on those social media platforms. Also on Facebook, we have two pages on there. We have Sports Inquirer, all one word, and also The Sports Inquirer. So you go to either one of those pages and you'll see everything that we've been doing. And finally, subscribe to us on YouTube and SoundCloud under the Sports Inquirer. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to break down everything that happened at Wrestle Kingdom in the start of the 2020 calendar year here on the Verbal Submission Podcast. All right, welcome back to the Sports Inquirer Show. Emar so Soprajit here with you recording the Verbal Submission Podcast on January 10th, 2020. Yeah, less than a week ago, well, about a week ago, was the start of New Japan Wrestling's Wrestle Kingdom extravaganza. And it was well done, unique in the fact that the event still took place in the Tokyo Dome, but there were two nights instead of one. Traditionally, when I was trying to explain to somebody, uh, a friend of mine, I was watching Japanese wrestling, and I called it the WrestleMania for Japan. And now it's different because WrestleMania for WWE takes place, obviously, in the first quarter of the year, around March or April, sometimes even May, I guess, depending on where they want to set it up. But... Wrestle Kingdom is always the 4th of July, or January, excuse me, the first week of the calendar year. But this time, what they've done is they did two nights. They did January 4th and January 5th. And subsequently with that, you had two, uh, a different scenario, two of the top belts in the, in the promotion. The IWGP Heavyweight Championship and the Intercontinental Championship were merged together. So four men had the chance to win both titles over the two-night span. Before we get to the the four men that had those battles, I enjoy the pageantry of the Jushin Thunder Liger retirement, or Liger. Make sure I say it right. And I enjoyed several parts of it. One, the build-up to it was done well. Over the past few months, we've been following New Japan. He's fought all of his past enemies and t- tagged with some and uh, things along those lines. So the buildup has been excellent. So guys like Tiger Mask, that to Okada, to everyone in between have been able to either fight against Lager or fight for or against them. So I thought that was well done all throughout. And then the final two nights of it, of his matches were very good. I like the eight-man tag. He brought in some different guys from from different eras. I guess his friends. I must admit my Japanese wrestling knowledge doesn't go really past five years. Sure, I know about Aoki. I know about Muda and some of those guys. But if it's from five, if it's really from 2015 or yeah, 2015 and before, my knowledge is, is limited because I really just got into it the past three, four years. But I do know wrestling history and I recognize some. I do recognize some of the names, but it was good to see some of the older gentlemen fight in the match. He took the pin in the eight-man tag, and then he had another tag, and he brought back some of his old trainers and referees, and he took the tag, took the pin in the second match of Hiroshima uh, Takahashi, and I thought that was a symbolic passing of the torch of the the past and the present of the, the junior heavyweight division and to a guy in Takahashi who is the present and the future of the division. So I thought that was very appropriate. And it was a very Japanese approach to things. It's funny because when the United States talk about retirement matches and guys want to go out on top, the majority of the time if a Japanese wrestler is retiring, 
he loses, he loses his final match. And usually done in a symbolic way. The person who pins him is usually the guy that's going to be the future of the division and carry on what that previous man had done. Now, I must admit, I do like retirement ceremonies. And uh, I do like guys moving on. I'll get emotional. I almost teared up a little bit when uh, Takahashi pinned him. And he hurt he's, the entire Tokyo Dome. Had 40,000 plus people there were completely silent. And even the announcers. And I didn't cry. I didn't, I didn't shed a tear. But... It kind of re you realize that, you know, Thunder Lager, who we've seen fight in WCW, fight in WWE once or twice. But when we had those fights in the 90s of the Japanese wrestlers coming over to the United States, he was a really big guy with that. And mentioned Muda as well, were guys that came over and fought pretty extensively in North America. So his name has been very familiar and you recognize the... The clothing, and I'll get to that in a second as well, the importance of that, and things along those lines. So when he was pinned and he was over his final competitive match, I was like a little emotional. And then when they had the retirement ceremony at the New Year's Dash, I enjoyed seeing the different wrestlers. And another thing I liked about the ceremony, you notice that only the face or the good guys came out to celebrate with them. There were no Bullet Club members. Uh, there were no uh, other guys, even... Uh, uh, the uh, Sugugi san uh, gun. None of those guys came out to do the celebration. Those guys from Chaos and uh, and Takahashi, uh, those guys that came out and uh, and supported them. So I like that fight. I like like that part of it. And they gave the flowers when the the dignitaries of the of New Japan, like the president and things like that, when they came out and. And did it. I'm just going over my notes here. Yeah, when they came out and gave uh, Tanahashi. Yeah, when Tanahashi came out with the flowers, that was cool. And then you had Okada come out. That was that was good as well. But and, and I like the fact that I thought he may take off his mask because we've seen that in Mexican wrestling when a guy retires, he takes off the mask. He kept the mask on. And I guess the purpose of that was we and I saw him do commentary in the. Uh, the the Fantastico matches that they're doing with CMLL in the New Japan. So he keeps the mask on, so I guess he can still do promotions and still be involved in professional wrestling. He's not wrestling, but he can still be a commentator, I guess an ambassador for the sport. So I guess he kept the mask on in that regard. I like the fact that he was in his battle gear. He didn't wear a, a suit or a, a shirt and tie or even just a t-shirt during a retirement ceremony. He kept his full garb on. It's a little unique because he's not fighting, and he said that as well. That usually when he wears that gear, he's ready to compete. But I thought that having that image of him in the in the battle gear and the the mask, the traditional mask, was, was a good thing. I will say when his wife and son came out to give him flowers, that's when I got a little emotional. And I was like, because that that still is true as family, and that was pretty cool to see all of that stuff. So I'm so I'm glad he got his retirement ceremony. It was very well done. And they, they do a very good job with that. On to the end of ring action that was of interest. We already have three match of the year candidates. I like the fact that the final four guys in the for the Intercontinental and the Heavyweight Championship were guys who obviously had a motivation and a purpose to be in there. You had Okada, who you may argue is the best wrestler in the world, who came into the event as the Heavyweight Champion. That the man is not even 40 yet and has accomplished so much. It was fair to have him in there. Then you had Ibushi, who has come back to Japan in the past year and made his presence felt, won the G1 tournament. So so he is a man who is uh, was worthy of that. Then you had uh, Jay White, the Intercontinental Champion. Since he's come back for excursion less than two years ago, he's become really the top foreigner a non-Japanese wrestler in the promotion. So he obviously deserved his spot. And then Naito, who is the people's champion, a man that from ha, did not have good footing in the promotion a few years ago, went on an excursion himself to Mexico, came back as leader of Los Incorables de Japón, and has made himself a fan favorite and worked his way into the title picture. The first match that I thought was match of the year was Okada, who beat Ibushi in the first night to retain the IWGP Heavyweight Championship. 
tremendous back and forth effort. We know about Okada and his skill level, but I like the emotion that Ibushi showed. We saw his evil side. We saw him about 15 minutes or 20 minutes into the match make a turn and not react to the punches of Okada. And he didn't work as a heel. And even Okada, he didn't work as a heel either. But they showed some... I thought the criticism I see of Ibushi, he's so robotic. He's so emotionless. But he showed that emotion in the match. Uh, Okada also sh- went... He, he fights well and he doesn't like to cheat. But you saw him get some few punch, extra punches in. Kind of work in a heelish way. And I thought that emotion that they did was tremendous. And the back and forth affair... Abushi took multiple Rainmakers, kicked out of those. Abushi put his finisher in many times. And got it got kicked out. But in the end, Okada went back to some tombstones and was able to get the win. Okada then faced Naito in the second night, and that's when Naito was able well, let's go back to that first night. Naito was able to defeat Jay White to win the Intercontinental Championship. I thought that was a very good move. Those two guys feuded throughout the fall, and even in the G1, they were uh, in, in that situation. I thought it was a good job Naito winning that. Going into it, I thought Naito was the least likely guy to win the the two belts. But then I saw someone talk about Ibushi. He won the G1, and I think only one time did the G1 champion win his first G1 and then win the heavyweight championship at Wrestle Kingdom. I think Okada did it earlier in his career. So Ibushi was kind of behind the eight ball in that regard. So when I read that statistic and I thought about it, I was like, okay, I think Naito has a chance against Jay White. And I think Jay White is kind of going a different path, and we'll get to Jay uh, later on on the show. But Naito was able to defeat Jay White and win the championship. And then you had the finals, uh, the second night on January 5th, Okada versus Naito. Naito finally won the championship. This is a rivalry that goes back several years. Naito really should have been champion two years ago if you look at it, and that's what the fans wanted. But Okada won the belt, and he kept the belt. Okada is the bell winner, or his bell cow of the promotion, so you understand how they want him to continue to win the championship and be a representation of the promotion. But Naito has gotten such momentum with the uh, Los Encarabas and just his fighting style. And when I saw him come out with the dark suit instead of the white suit, I knew he meant business. Little symbolisms like that, you know that he's ready to go. So that match was so well done, well executed. Both guys got their stunt, their stuff in. And he did the roll call, and for those of you not familiar with New Japan or with with uh, Naito, after every big win, he liked to do a roll call of all of the wrestlers in his faction. He was able to get halfway through it until Kenta came in from the Bullet Club of the Bullet Club came in and took him out and ruined that roll call that fans have literally been waiting years to hear. So Kenta is, mer- is himself set himself up as the first opponent of Naito. As the, and he's the most hated man in J- Japanese wrestling. I like the turn that Kenson made midway through the year. He came in with a lot of his fanfare. Uh, he, had, he had the seal of approval from Shibata and did some training with the LA Dojo and came in as a good guy. But the thing about Kenta is that he comes from another Japanese wrestling promotion. So he's not a New Japan guy. And the fans of New Japan are kind of lukewarm towards him. So you know what you do? You turn him, you have him turn on Shibata, his uh, childhood friend, literally, and have one of the best heel turns in the history of professional wrestling. It's definitely in the top five all time. Maybe not the best, but it's definitely in contention. You put him with the Bullet Club, a group of foreigners that New Japan traditionalists do not like, and you now have him take out Naito on the biggest night of his career. I think that's a solid first opponent for Naito, because you don't want to run back Okada yet. That Okada's going to be champion again eventually. But you don't want to run back to that too quickly. I think Ibushi kind of has his own thing going. I like him and, Ta- and uh, Tanahashi together. Trying to maybe go for the tag belts against Finjuice. So Ibushi, he's another guy. He? And the crazy thing is, Ibushi and Naito are the same exact age. And they look so different. You would think Naito is in his 50s. And Ibushi is in his 20s. Yet both guys, I think, are 37 years old. Incredible how you got two different wrestlers have that different type of look. So, and then I said, Jay has his own path kind of going as well. So having Kenta 
in the title picture for Naito's first contender, I think it's a good move because you want to have a guy. I'm talking about the, I'm a booker now, or the, I run the, I'm running a promotion. You want their first. You don't want to take the belt immediately for, away from Naito. You want him to have a belt for a, a while to build it up, but you don't want to have an opponent that no one respects as his first opponent. And that's where you get someone like Naito. I mean, you get someone like Kenta to face Naito, who's a viable opponent. But ultimately, you'll see Naito emerge from that feud. So I like how they did that overall as far as the, the title pictures. Another major title that changed hands in the, the Knights was uh, Hiromu Takahashi defeating Will Ospreay to win the IWGP light heavyweight title. Now, I talk about Okada being the best wrestler in the world. Will Ospreay may be right there with you. The thing about Will, though, and, for, and I say all of this, the man is not even 30 yet. I think he's 26 or 27 years old. And I'm saying he may be the best wrestler in the world. That's a scary proposition in a good way that the man has developed so much over the past year. Since he signed that long-term deal with New Japan, he's really made a turn. His match against Takahashi, and not only did it have high flying to it, has psychology involved. Takahashi, who is coming back from a severe neck injury that some feared would end his career. He was out of wrestling for more than a year. The time bomb has come back. And he's even, he even took some losses in the lead up to the to Wrestle Kingdom. So you weren't sure if he had enough stamina and enough ring work to compete against a guy like Will Ospreay, who was coming and taking over that light heavyweight division. Both guys had sequences back and forth, taking topes and flips out of the ring. Just tremendous effort. And Takahashi ultimately getting the win. I, w I like Will Ospreay personally, uh, but I can understand Takahashi as a man who is another guy similar to, to Naito, a fan favorite. People love his eccentric personality and his style. And people have been waiting a long time to see Takahashi get that belt. And he was able to emerge with the championship. So I thought that match was a potential match of the year as well. So well done, well executed. And now Takahashi, as I said, he also pinned uh, Thunder Lager in his Lager in his final match. So Takahashi had a very productive weekend or a two, a three nights of action in the uh, Wrestle Kingdom time. Finn Juice, Dave Finley, and Juice Robinson defeated Gorillas of Destiny to win the IWGP Tag Team titles. Finn Juice won the World Tag League. Very impressive fashion. Two guys who, if you're familiar with American wrestling, you've seen them fight in the United States. You've seen David Finley, uh, son of Fit Finley, obviously a legendary wrestler in that regard, in WWE. So you've seen David Finley had a severe soldier, shoulder injury early in 2019, worked his way back to health right before the World Tag League Tournament. I thought it was kind of a mixed together, put together team with Juice Robinson. Juice Robinson we saw as Parker in NXT and just did not work out with the WWF or WWE. Went to New Japan, went into the dojo, worked his way back, and is now the flamboyant Juice Robinson. So two Americans, I think Finley, I know Juice is American. Juice is from the Southeast. I think Finley's American as well, or he might, or his father is obviously Irish. Uh, but two guys who are North American based, as far as we know, are in New Japan and won the championships from Gorillas of Destiny. My favorite, personal favorite tag team. I love Tamatanga and Tangaloa. Uh, but I understand that move as well. You get some younger guys. You ha get get a face to win the win a championship. God, Gorillas of Destiny. I don't think they're going anywhere. I think you'll see them lurking around. They will be intriguing, I think, if we really get an AEW New Japan merger. Not merger, but some working with each other. Gorilla's Destiny could come to the United States and be tremendous. And they already did that. They were Ring of, they were Ring of Honor champions before, so they've worked in the United States quite a bit. But I think that'd be a really solid tag team for AEW if it goes down that route. But now we have Takahashi and Ibushi showing interest in fighting Thin Juice. I think that's another group that if, Ta if Tanah Tanahashi and Ibushi lose to Finjus, that's not the worst thing in the world. Both those guys are established singles. But I think that'd just be a fun feud to have going on over the next few months. So Finjus winning was cool. 
John Moxley defeated Lance Archer in a Texas Death Match and in the first night of Wrestle Kingdom, and then Juice Robinson in the second night to keep the IWGP United States Championship. Moxley talked about guys who had breakout 2019 campaigns. You have to put John Moxley in that group. We always we've known him as Dean Ambrose in WWE for a very long time, working on the, in the Shield. His time just ran out in 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 the WWE. He's transitioned into New Japan, working at AEW as well, kind of being the top independent guy out there, working both promotions. His match against Lance Archer, I like the fact that it was. And this is where they messed up when Moxley fought Kenny Omega in a similar kind of death match or a, a no holds barred match in AEW, it lasted 40 plus minutes. And these guys put themselves through tables and through wires and all this other stuff that which your match should not last more than 10 to 15 minutes in new Japan against Lance Archer. They did it right. They fought hard. They got some power shots in and, um, and, uh, Moxley put Archer through a table. He couldn't answer the 20 count match is over in 15 minutes. That was an appropriate way to have a Texas death match. Those matches did not last more than 15 minutes. You put a big move in, most humans, and I know it's wrestling, so we suspend things as far as suspend our disbelief. But if you put a power move in, you should not get up from a 20 count if it's something severe. And the way he put Archer through the table, that qualifies. So I thought that was a very good move. Suzuki now fighting John Moxley is just a hardcore wrestler's dream. Suzuki, who in real life scares the crap out of me, <laughs> and uh, he would he would concern me. But no, he is a tremendous. He's a fan favorite, but his look with the the half shaved with the, the head shaved, but like in lines, his he looks like a, a young lion with his just trunks and the dark boots and his facials. Him and Moxley are gonna have some fun drag out matches. I enjoyed seeing that, and both guys getting over on each other over the three nights. That was very well done. Rapongi 3K defeated El Fantasmo and Ishimura Ishimuri to win the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Titles. I kind of like the Bullet Club group of Fantasmo and uh, Ishimuri, but Rapongi 3K, a uh, show and yo, those guys are uh, very popular, especially with the younger fans. So I kind of understand why that move was made. Zack Sabre Jr. defeated Sonata to retain the British Heavyweight Championship. I would like Sonata. I think he's the kind of next in line. Out of the, you talk about those four guys in a, when the main event picture for the heavyweight championship, and then Kenta. I think Sonata is working himself two, three years from now. He could be a world champion, without question. So I think they're slowly bringing him along. It would be nice to see him win that championship. But Saber Jr. He's a good heel. You just want to punch him. That he does a very good job of being the agitator. In uh, Suzuki Gun, so I, I, interesting stuff there, but I, I didn't mind that at all. Goto winning the open, never open weight title over Kenta. I guess we learned that if Kenta was going to fight for the heavyweight championship, he had to drop the never open weight title. I like the fact that this match was personal, was intense, it, and it kind of went back. I said the with the uh, Kenta. Joining Bullet Club and uh, turning on Shibata. Goto is Shibata's best friend. Along Those three were very close. They're buddies. So Goto, since Shibata can't fight anymore, or as of now with his injuries, Goto getting the title and getting revenge for his friend Shibata, I thought storyline-wise was very well done. Takagi being an inch, is a, the drag, an interesting opponent, I think, for Goto as far as the never open weight title. I think Ishii is right there as well. Never open weight title is just one of those things where it's literally a never open weight. It could, be a, it could be a junior heavyweight. It could be a super heavyweight. No matter what you are, you can throw your hat in the ring. But to got, Takagi being in there is interesting. And then finally, last note from the three nights, Chris Jericho defeating Tanahashi and the acknowledgement of AEW on Japanese airwaves and him having the belt very, very good for business. And I think it's such a good, it's beneficial in both ways. You have guys in Japan, the young lions who need excursions. I know they go to Rev Pro in England, but having another entity for them, CMLL, they go to Mexico, but having and them go to the United States is a good thing. 
I think getting the name, and then also, you look at AEW, all the top guys have extensive experience in Japan. The Young Bucks, obviously, have had fun in Japan. There were multiple junior heavyweight, junior heavyweight tag team champions. Kenny Omega, who you can argue, him and Okada were the top wrestlers in New Japan over the past five, six years before AEW merged. Having Omega have his presence in Japan coming back would be great as well. So Jericho in the press conference post-match openly talking about a relationship is very good. And then Tanahashi, is kind of, he really is like the John Cena. Of, and I see these comparisons for some of you that are unfamiliar with New Japan to and that, but do watch WWE you can like oh make references to it he really is like the John Cena he may be Okada's probably the I, I'll do a ranking eventually as far as the all time guys as far as the best ever I, I, but Tanahashi is really he is like the John Cena he's very popular he's a face he's had some of the best matches ever the longevity you have to respect so him losing to Jericho is not a bad thing. If anything, it builds up an excellent rematch that could take place over the next 6 to 12 months. So I, I like Jericho winning that match and maybe a potential relationship going on there. Because both sides can use each other. The New Japan is expanding into the United States. They're doing, remember they have a show taking place in Atlanta on February 1st. I need to purchase the tickets. I'm about to look it up after we finish the show. So they're coming here to do different shows. We've seen them go to Mass Square Garden to do a big uh, merger or big tandem show with with the Ring of Honor. So we've seen them say Star G1 in Dallas, Texas during the summer. First time G1 took place. Uh, a G, the first round of G1 took place outside of Japan. So we're seeing the expansion of New Japan into these different entities. So having AEW as an anchor would be a very good thing. Ring of Honor as well. I see Jeff Cobb was Ring of Honor wrestler. He's doing some events for, he's doing some shows for New Japan. That's all good. The, not everyone can be WWE and kind of operate in their own individual island. They all need to work together. So I like seeing that. All right, we're going to take a final break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about other miscellaneous news and notes in the world of professional wrestling and mixed martial arts here on the Verbal Submission Podcast. All right, final segment of the Sports Inquirer show slash Royal Submission Podcast. This is a submission podcast. It's not Sports Inquirer show, but you're listening to us, E. Marcel Patoot, recording this on January 10th, 2020. Been catching up on NWA Power. I love what I'm seeing from that as well. I know it's a wrestling podcast or mixed martial arts, so we got to be, you should be negative and we hate everything going on. Storylines stink and I hate this guy being pushed. But it's just been a good few weeks of professional wrestling. Even WWE is trying. Brock Lesnar being the number one person in the Royal Rumble in the next few weeks. That, cause that's intriguing. I'm actually going to watch, see what happens there. Uh, the Lana and uh, Bobby Lashley wedding, not so much. But hey, you know, certain things, you got to take what you can. You got to take the wins where you can get them. But going back to NWA, I love what they're doing. The, the weekly show on YouTube, I'm able to watch it multiple times. It's on demand. I already know, already know Tuesday night or Wednesday morning at the latest. I can turn on, turn the show, see what's going on. I love Nick Aldis. He's showing himself as a heel that works in 2020. I think heels on a lot of prof- a lot of entities are trying to be cool and get the fan favorites. I think Jay White does a very good job of that with the Bullet Club in Japan. Aldis, he has the faction now with the uh, the, the business, strict the business or has that going on he has uh, his has a his late his valet well she she's a fighter herself uh, Camille so he has a good thing going uh, with that and then Tim Storm is showing what a modern day baby face can be I think what and this is where WWE messes up at times and AEW a little bit as well they make the the face or the baby face look weak and look look timid now the Babyface usually gets screwed or gets the, the wrong end of things so that they can fight back and show grit, but they don't have to be soft. Tim Storm is that. He mentions Mama Storm, his his, uh, his elderly mother, he, and, she's, and how she wants him to fight for the dream, so Mama Storm's popular. He has a look to him. He's an older gentleman. He's in his 50s and still fighting for that championship. He's won the championship before, but I think NWA is looking at it from... No one's watched our program before the past few months when power started. 
So the fact that Tim Storm has been the champion before, they're treating it like he's never been the world champion. So, but I like that though, like the approach of how they're kind of rebranding some things. And there's a great group of secondary guys in there mixed with veterans. Colt Cabana, Ken Anderson, the Rock and Roll Express, the current NWA tag team champions. I'm talking about guys that are in their 50s. Those guys, uh, uh, Ricky and Bobby, they got to be in their 60s at least. But you have uh, those guys fighting. But it, And then James Storm, I think I mentioned. Aaron Stevens, question mark. Even Eli Drake. These are guys that we've seen before in other promotions. But they've kind of reinvented themselves in the NWA entity. They're getting promos over them. And I like what I'm seeing. Even the women's division is a solid group led by Melina. We've had ODB. She's been in there. So we're familiar with her because she's been she was on TNA for a very long time. And then Melina, we've seen at WWE you know, quite a bit. The other women, we're not too familiar with yet. But and they're but they're young, they're intriguing, and they're kind of fitting into the storyline. So I like how you have the veterans, people that we know, but we have people we may not know, like the wild cards. We're familiar with like a, a Josephus, people that unless you're a hardcore wrestling fan, you've not seen them on your TV. But you're seeing them on NWA Power, but they have the backing of some people that we're familiar with. So I like how they've been doing it. The commentary has been very good. I like Jim Cornette, and I'm a big, I'm part of the cult of Cornette. Uh, I've already experienced. I, I listen to the show every week, and with his drive-throughs and his general show. But I think the move to Barrett, as far as commentator, is a good move. I think Cornette was solid as the as the announcer, and the way that he was let go by NWA, I thought was a little shady, just based on. He made one random comment that they could have edited out, but then they left on the show, and then people got mad about it, and then he got fired. I thought it was a little, a little much, but to get Barrett on there was very good. He brings credibility. He brings a toughness, and I like the fact that if things go down, he can fight. Oh, and the Pope is back. I love, we love the Pope. The Pope is, when I worked at TNA, Pope was very friendly, uh, just a talented guy. I like the fact that you can see him pop up as a manager, doing some commentary. He looks like he's in tremendous shape. So the Pope, if he can fight in some form, that'd be very good too. But I like that they're bringing those guys in. Marty Skrull, we'll see what happens with the villain, see what his role is. But NWA, I've been very impressed by all the stuff that I've been seeing. So it's been good times overall in the world of professional wrestling. As far as mixed martial arts, I've been kind of slacking on that, but I know the big fight coming up is the Cowboy Donald Cerrone fight against Conor McGregor later on this month. When we get close to that fight, we'll preview it. Uh, but that can go so many ways. But it's glad to see both those go. Cerrone, he, he's a beast. He's a guy who fights all the time but and is a, res, a tremendous. He's become a legend of the sport. But it's good to see Conor McGregor back in the mixed martial art cage. He's not boxing. He's not promoting his alcohol. And I mean, and respect to him, he's his own man. And he could do all those things. But it's good to see him fighting in a mixed martial arts cage where he got his start and where we know him best from. So it's good to see him in there. I don't know if he's going to fight after this because he's made so much money and he's a wild card uh, in that regard. But it's still good to see him at least scheduled to make a fight in the UFC. So we'll see what happens there. Thanks for listening to today's show. I'm very excited, as you can tell, that we have a new year of combat sports to discuss. Head to the mothership, the sportsinquire.net, premier site for news and notes in the world of sports. Go to our Twitter and Instagram under Sports Inquire, that's all one word. Facebook, The Sports Inquire, or Sports Inquire. Go to one of those pages. And then find, subscribe to us on YouTube and SoundCloud under The Sports Inquire. Until next time, good fight and good night.